Tonight, I am going to continue talking about the book Interconnected. Complete title is Interconnected, Embracing Life in Our Global Society by Galwan Karmapa. I am on the section here that is titled Empathy to Courageous Compassion. And tonight I'm going to start this section by uh, talking about the most challenging cases. This is on page 108 of my copy of the book. He starts off by saying that uh, there are mass shootings and that this is an example of a person who does that. They become very cruel, callous. They're controlled by fear and panic. And Karmapa uses the Boston Marathon bomber as an example of this. And we need to do what we can to try to stop this from happening to other people. Quote, if we are not aware of the emotional turmoil raging inside of those around us, we have little hope for anticipating violent behavior, much less reaching out to the person in order to prevent it. So it's important to pay attention to other people and their mental state. So this brings up some questions here. The first one is, can a person recover uh, and regain empathy once it's gone? And the next question is, if that's possible, how is it possible? What can be done by the person, by other people, for them to regain this empathy? Karmapa brings up the story of Angula Mala, who lived at the time of the Buddha. The story is that he was the student of, of a man, a teacher, and the teacher's wife was rebuffed when she made sexual advances to his student, Angula Mala. And so she told her husband, made up a lie and said that he had made a sexual advance to her and when it really was the opposite. So her husband then convinced Angula Mala that if he killed a thousand people, he would acquire supernatural powers. And course, this was a total lie, but he wanted to destroy Angula Mala. So Angula Mala took this seriously and went out on a, you might say, what would you call it? He was a serial murderer or a serial killer. And he had gotten up to 999 and then he decided that the Buddha would be his last and final one, and then he would attain these supernatural powers. The Buddha, on the other hand, recognized that he had Buddha nature and that underneath all of this, it was possible for him to change. So the Buddha worked with him rather than try to either run away from him or try to kill him. And as a result, he became a student of the Buddha, became a monk, and eventually became a source of inspiration to other people because he did regain his compassion. So the point is that we need to extend ourselves 
to look beyond the surface of people that seem like they are just totally evil and that nothing can be done. And this brought to mind a program that I attended that was led by Thich Nhat Hanh. And for some reason or another, he brought up Osama bin Laden. This program that I attended was in 2003. So this was not that long after the attack on the Twin Towers in Manhattan. And what he said is that he would like to meet with bin Laden. And he would ask him, why did you cause these planes to crash into the World Trade Center? That's what he wanted to know. Why did you do it? So that finishes that section. It would be good, I guess the point of this is that it's good to look beneath the surface and try to find out why people behave the way they do. Now the next section is condemn the behavior, not the person. So again, he goes back to Osama bin Laden here. This book was written, I think it came out in print in 2017. And he talks about what he felt when he heard that Osama bin Laden had been killed. And he said that what stuck out in his mind was that people were celebrating, publicly getting together and celebrating his death. And Karmapa feels that that's going way too far because this is not only a lack of empathy, but it's actually celebrating the death of another human being. Karmapa said that he felt I can't remember the exact words that he used, but he felt uh, no great pain about the killing of Osama bin Laden, but he certainly did not feel like celebrating, singing and dancing and getting together with other people and celebrating it. We need to have empathy. And also he brings out this point that Killing terrorists will never kill terrorism. On the other end, people's minds are workable unless they're mentally ill. The word is diminished also in the book. If they're mentally ill or diminished, then it might be impossible for them to change their minds in this lifetime. But it's the behavior that is the problem. And this can be changed. And the reason why killing terrorists won't end terrorism is that you create more terrorists. We could go to investigate the war in Gaza right now, and this is upsetting a lot of people in the Middle East. And turning them even more against Israel than they were before the war started. So this is not going to end a terrorism in the Middle East. Uh, there's just no question about that. A quote from Karmapa here in his book is, the belief that our enemies are utterly unlike us is a significant problem. It is a major part of how enemies are created in the first place. And it is a part that we ourselves can change. So if we can see people that we are looking at as enemies as being more like ourselves, 
this can help break through and remove barriers between us. It's very well known that when another person becomes an other, that they are much easier to be afraid of, to hate, to want to kill. I think we're all familiar with propaganda that countries will put out depicting the enemy as vermin, as rats, as all kinds of subhuman beings. I remember from the Vietnam War, certain people in the American government, when they would be asked about napalming civilians, the answer would be something like, they don't suffer like we do. Then, of course, there was that famous video of this little girl that was running with all her clothes burnt off of her from napalm. And there would be film of people crying and crying and crying over their dead loved ones that were on the ground in front of them. And it was pretty hard to say that they don't suffer like we do. So it's important to realize this, that even the family of terrorists, when a terrorist, what we call a terrorist or what somebody else calls a terrorist, when they die, the family can suffer too. Once we understand the underlying reasons for this kind of behavior, we can work on removing the causes. At the present time, terrorism is increasing across the planet. And if we don't address it, it's just going to get more and more and more of a problem. And this is happening uh, in the United States. I hate to talk about politics, but people think a person that is opposed to their view of politics then is worthy of sending them threatening messages, giving them threatening phone calls watching them, if you know what that is, that's where you call up the police and say that I am suicidal, I just killed my wife, help. And they give the address of someone that they consider is a political enemy. And anyway, all of this can be solved besides just locking people up or killing people and so forth. We'll never uproot terrorism if we don't go to the root causes, Karmapa says. And he says that because of interdependence, it's possible to counteract these acts nonviolently, that there are nonviolent solutions to this problem. And that we don't have to change everything. All we need to do is change one or two of the underlying causes or conditions. And as a result, change will happen. So this requires understanding. It is necessary to have knowledge and understanding and then look deeply. I can tell you this as a retired prison chaplain that the warden told me without me asking. He just came right out and said it. Punishment doesn't work. The death penalty doesn't work other than you've killed somebody. I remember an inmate told me this one time that he had been a member of a gang in Chicago and that he would go into a gang fight, not caring if he lived or died. 
he literally was emotionally at that point where he didn't care if he lived or died. And if you don't care if you lived or you died, how is punishment going to deter it? Also, an interesting thing that I have noticed about many, not all, but many of the people that have done mass killings, like going into a school with an assault rifle and start shooting, is first they kill their mother, and then after they have killed as many people as they can, they kill themselves. So obviously, being afraid of the death penalty is not going to deter that either. So this goes back to we need to look at the underlying problems, the underlying conditions, and investigate nonviolent solutions to these very, very deeply troubled individuals. Again, condemn the behavior, not the person. Now, the next section is titled, Before Casting the First Stone. Quote, we need to understand our negative inner conditions so we can reduce them and base our connections with others on your positive qualities instead. He describes our conflicting emotions as a being like an illness. And again, a person that is ill would, if they were reasonable and wise, blame the illness, not themselves for being sick. So we need to see this in ourselves and then realize again that this is the way it is with others. After you've gotten angry and you've really lost it to anger, analyze it, analyze yourself, analyze how it happened. And then when you understand it, realize that this is what happens to other people as well. And this can give you a lot of insight on the way other people behave. I can tell you this from working in a prison as a prison chaplain, that many of the men that I came in contact with had very traumatic childhoods. They really never had a loving relationship as a child. They had very difficult conditions. Not everybody is like this, but many of them are. And it's very difficult to develop empathy and compassion, even for yourself, much less other people, when you're in a survival mode when you are young. I remember I was talking to one inmate about something or another, and I asked a little bit about what his childhood was like. And he said something to the effect of, well, I had a normal childhood. My mother was an alcoholic. My father was gone, and he went down the line. And, well, it may have been normal for him, but... This is not normal in terms of what a healthy childhood is. And it was no wonder why he was in prison, because what was normal is considered abnormal by the criminal justice system. And some inmates would say, if I hadn't been arrested and incarcerated, I'd be dead by now. So... We need to look at people that are really suffering as needing, at least pointing the, to 
there are problems that if they are addressed, things can be better, at least for a future generation, if not these individuals. Again, I'm going to into this a little deeper from my own experience. I just saw a news item about a prison in California that they're starting a totally new experimental way of working with and rehabilitating prisoners. And it is to treat them like they're human beings, to treat them like they will be treated when they get released so that they become responsible for taking care of themselves. And among other things, of course, a dog training program for dogs, for the people that need emotional support or physical support dogs. And of course, this teaches the inmate to care for another being. And if you can care for a dog, there's a possibility that that will rub off and you'll start caring for humans a little more too. And they had a picture, a little part of this news item was some of the inmates working with horses, grooming horses and so forth. It was very interesting. And you might say that it's too early to definitively know whether it's working or not, but the all signs were that it was working and it was based on the success they've had in Norway with prisons there by making things more liberal and more like life on the outside. And of course it produced a situation, living situation, which is safer for the inmates. There's less inmate on inmate violence and much less inmate on staff violence. So it, it's so many different ways that it's benefiting people. And it shows that people can be rehabilitated if they are treated correctly in a positive way. There's so much that is workable. A lot of people think can't be workable. So the Karmapa is talking about this, that if we can look more deeply, uh, look into things, see where a little change here or a little change there can make a big difference over time. People actually can change surprisingly quickly. We're not as solid as a lot of us think we are. We can change our behavior. We can change our attitudes. Again, this comes to mind. There was an inmate that said, I was sexually assaulted when I was a little boy, and there's nothing I can do about that. Well, eventually he went off to a maximum security prison. I worked in a medium security. And the problem was, his attitude was he could, couldn't change that. And all he was dealing with now was his memory and any habitual patterns that developed as a result of that incident. He was unwilling to even realize, much less admit, that he could change his attitudes, he could change the memory, he could change his behavior, because all of this was in the past, and the past is gone. If you can't change in the present, well, if we just brought up everybody with loving kindness, there would be no problem, because they couldn't change. How about that for a policy? <laughs> anyway, you get the point that we can change. We're Buddhists because we know we can change and we want to change. So I'm just going to leave it here that we need to keep our minds open that we can change and that others can change, circumstances can change, 
countries can change, and on and on and on. The weather can change. We were talking about that before we began. So we need to feel empathy for those that are suffering so much and causing so much suffering. And empathy for those that are above us in terms of economics, power, and so forth. We need to work on ourselves to reduce anger. We certainly don't want to put more anger into the world. There's plenty anger out there as it is. And we want to work on at least reducing our anger and reducing the anger that we put into the world and transmit to other people. And to finish up this section, happiness is within us. It's not outside of us. It's not something that we gain from outside experiences. It's in here, in our heart, in our mind, and that we can develop happiness. We can become happier. And it can become a boundless resource. We can put more happiness into the world. And if there's something that the world lacks, it is happiness also. Now, the next section is from empathy to compassion. Empathy is more of an intellectual understanding, realizing that the other people are similar to you. Empathy gives us understanding without condoning the other person. Compassion goes deeper than that, that compassion is more engaged with uh, other people, other beings. Galwan Karmapa describes it as being a more more active than empathy. Compassion is more active, that it motivates us to actually do something besides just think about it. The emotional understanding that empathy gives us is important, but when we join it with compassion or when it transforms into compassion, we enter the situation by actually doing something. We join our, our mind, our thoughts about it with our heart and with actions of body and speech. He uses this example. You pass someone on the street maybe a street person, and you feel empathy, but you just walk on by. Whereas with compassion, you stop, and maybe you do something, even if it is just acknowledging their existence rather than looking away as you walk by. This heart connection quickly leads to action of some kind or another. The distance between you and another person becomes very short. It's a very small distance, and it draws you into the other. And in fact, this boundary between self and others starts to dissolve. And as a result of that, actions occur. We start wanting to do something of some kind or another. So uh, he brings up the relationship between a mother and a child and how a mother feels towards her child. 
And this, of course, is a mother that does not have uh, blocks to empathy. But most mothers have quite a strong feeling towards their child. I, being a father, I'm only, you might say, expressing what the Karmapa expressed and what I saw when my former wife had our son and when he was very young. So this bond between a mother and a child is very strong in most cases. And in Tibetan Buddhism, we are encouraged to contemplate all sentient beings have been a mother to us at some point in our limitless number of previous lives and to treat uh, the others, whoever we meet, even the troublemakers, to be a lost mother and as a result to treat them with compassion. So this is used as a tool to help develop and strengthen our compassion towards others. Of course, we need to have wisdom to guide our actions. Without wisdom, our compassionate actions sometimes don't bear the results that we would like them to bear. Now, the next section is ending spectator compassion. And he says it's a bit like looking at a photograph of someone that is suffering, that there is this safe distance. It's this intellectual knowing about the suffering of other people, but there's no real significant feeling involved. When we have spectator compassion, it can cause a feeling of helplessness, of hopelessness, and even depression. It can lead to a very negative view of the world. It's possible to go down a very negative path that you attach to the suffering, you hang on to it, and you don't let go of it, that it's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You might just focus in when more bad things happen, focus in on them and not see anything good happening in the world. And you can get very depressed, very negative about the world. And we want to avoid that. Quote, this is the irony of compassion. When your awareness of others' suffering remains mere knowledge without full effective involvement, it can cause you pain and distress. Once you connect completely on the level of feelings, that distress goes away. End quote. So if we just are spectators, it can cause more problems and more problems and lead to in a very negative direction. But if we connect at the heart level, this distress goes away. And what happens this is my own interpretation of this, is that when you hold on to it and it's there 24-7, it just becomes very solid. When you actually act, then you let go. These great beings like Dalai Lama and Yawan Karmapa, they hear one sad story after another after another but they also see the good in the people that are telling them these stories and even in the people that might be 
responsible for all the negative things that have happened to these people, but then you let go of it. You don't live in the past, you live in the present. So we have to let go of the negativity that we that comes in, whether it be through the news, through hearing from other people, through what we see. We have to let go of the negativity or it just builds up and builds up and builds up until we just feel totally overwhelmed. It's a bit like the man that I told you that said, I was sexually assaulted when I was young and there's nothing I can do about that. Well, if you hold on to that and hold on to it and hold on to it, yes, it will get you down and you will be fixated and there's nothing you can do about it. So what we can do about it is act on the compassion that rises within us and then let go of it. Don't live in the past. So realize that these things are workable, that we can learn techniques to make them workable. Karmapa says here, once you connect with the person's pain, now look for solutions. You have empathy for someone that you see suffering and it overwhelms you with the suffering, that is not a sign that you haven't fully come into the other person's place. You need to go beyond that, letting the suffering of another being overwhelm you, that you need to do something about it. We need to, if nothing else, direct our attention in a direction where we can do something. So we can work with a condition that a being is experiencing great suffering. We can direct our attention to a place where we can help. And so on and so forth. And just realize that we can be flexible. I guess this is my analogy, like a vacuum cleaner that just sucks up suffering and more suffering, and more suffering, and then pretty soon the vacuum cleaner bag is full. And now it doesn't work anymore because it's full. Karmapa advises to avoid focusing in on just the suffering, especially if it causes you to feel it's too much or make you feel that it's overwhelming. If we can connect with the person in their pain, you won't even consider giving up as an option or abandoning them as an option. The next section is called Courage is the Root of Compassion. Courage is having a strong aspiration to act on your compassion to go beyond this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. This is seeing the situation rather than focusing on the suffering. Especially the immensity of the suffering. You might not be able to feed the whole world, but you can help get food to people that are hungry, even if it's making a donation to a food bank. I haven't done this for quite a while, but the local Ridgeland post office, and for those of you that are watching this that aren't familiar with Ridgeland, the population on the sign as you enter Ridgeland says 258 people. And the post office is only open until 1230 in the afternoon. They close because there's not enough business to keep them open longer than that. The lobby, which is very small, 
because it's a very small post office, has a table on it. And you can leave food on that table. They have certain rules. It should be packaged, non-perishable, and a few other things like that. But then anybody can come into the lobby and take any of the food that's left on that table. It's a very simple thing that a person can do to help alleviate suffering of hunger. And there's so many other things that can be done. I have left food there, and it's always gone when I come next time. So rather than focusing on, oh, this is too big a problem, it's immense, nothing I can do, well, do something, even if it's a little thing. And Quote, with compassion, the result, happiness, is present before you. It's like a finish line in a race. You might be tired physically, but you are sustained by your determination not to stop until you have reached your final goal. You are sustained by joy at the prospect of attaining that goal. <laughs> 